This video is only possible thanks to viewers like you. To support the channel and get more, go to patreon.com slash optimistic duelist and subscribe. Link in the description. There are few fantasy stories out there that deal with the relationship between parent and child as deeply as Homestuck does, grappling with their complexity and nuance enough to echo how those relationships often feel in real life. It does this by breaking parenthood down into two distinct functions, meaning that to talk about the parents of Homestuck in any coherent way, as we'll be doing in this episode, we've got to separate them into two distinct roles, guardians and ancestors. Guardians are parents as caretakers. They protect their charges from the world, meet the basic needs they need to live, and run their households. This function is even more important in Homestuck than it is in reality for one reason. In Paradox Space, thought literally creates reality. Even at a young age, our heroes are on some level creating their own experiences of life and the world. And in that context, guardians are serving a particularly important role. They control the kids' environments by providing the structure of their own, more developed wills. So we can see them as filling in for the figure of God in the Book of Genesis, controlling and structuring their respective child's Garden of Eden. This makes it a big deal when a guardian is absent, incompetent, or even exploitative or cruel to their charges, which happens a lot in Homestuck since the child's understanding of the world and their place in it is built around the particular world that their guardian builds for them, all of which comes to reflect the damage that existing in an imperfect or flawed world inherently does to a person, which serves to color the nature of the evil that Lord English inflicts on the story, as the creator of the worlds that all of Homestuck exists in. In the Beta Kids session, all of the Guardians and Ancestors are, to varying degrees, connected to or even aware of Lord English's grand design, and the more connected to Lord English they are, the less sympathetic they turn out to be, and the worse they are as Guardians to their children. Nana was raised by Lord English's right-hand woman, the Batter Witch, but she doesn't learn about the apocalypse until after she dies. Her son becomes a private investigator researching the mysteries of Spurb, but never seems to come too close to the truth. John's dad is also the most well-adjusted parent in the cast, and Nana proves a kind and supportive grandmother once she becomes his sprite. Mom at least knows that an apocalypse is coming, and seems to have a hand in bringing it about. At least partly as a result of this, she's an alcoholic, making her behavior erratic and confusing to Rose, setting the stage for their codependence. Grandpa is the one to uncover the Spurb ruins, and puts the game into motion to begin with. He manages to enter the kid's Spurb session well before it even begins, using either the Durs and Prospet teleporters hidden under the temple elevator, or the Sky and Defense portals that pop up in Earth's orbit at various points, and he fills his house with Egyptian iconography that speaks to an awareness of Ellie's existence. But in the process, he's outright negligent to Jade, ignoring her completely while she almost shoots herself. After he dies, Jade is raised by Becquerel, who is of course a good dog as well as a best friend, but he's also a First Guardian, an entity literally powered by the green sun that Lord English created, and the actions he takes to protect Jade end up giving that power to one of Lord English's favorite agents, Jack Knorr, who goes on to become the terror that dominates the kid's session. And finally, Bro is exposed directly to Lord English's soul his entire life in the form of Lil Cow, and Bro is… well, he's Bro. We'll talk about him in Lil Cow's episode, but the bottom line is he's not a good time for Dave. After running some errands to basically set the kids' game up, all of the Beta Guardians quickly meet their ends. John's dad and Rose's mom become a couple and get dropped off on Skya, where they're happy until they're eventually killed by Beck Nor. After leaving them and picking up the corpse of Jade's dream self, Grandpa heads back home where he knows he'll soon die. Bro proves the most interesting in death. It's kind of implied early on that Bro seemed to want to try and start the scratch early, 
bro has the means to know quite a bit about his life as one of the Alpha Kids, after all. Could it be that bro was fine with the idea of the Scratch wiping him out of existence if it brought about a reality where he grows up with his friends instead of Lil' Cow? It's a moving thought. While most of the Beta Guardians were fairly flawed as parents, it's a little hard to blame them considering they were all quite isolated and lonely people, and seemingly had nothing to look forward to except the apocalypse. The role of a troll's guardian is filled by their Lucis, genetically compatible animals with whom they develop intense symbiotic relationships. We'll talk about them in the trolls' character videos, so for now, how about we move on to the ancestors? Ancestors are a more abstract kind of parental figure, literally. Trolls never even meet the adult trolls they know as their ancestors, since they grow up centuries if not millennia after the ancestor has lived and died. For humans, the lines are muddier. Rose and Dave's guardians are also their ancestors. Rose is raised by her mom, and Dave by his bro. John's Nana died when he was born, though, and Jade's grandpa died when she was very young, so their ancestors are not their guardians for most of their lives. Essentially, ancestors are parents as role models. Their most important function is to give the child someone to look up to, a point of reference that the child can use to emulate or reject in various ways, helping them craft their own identities in relation to the world around them. In this respect, they're a useful foothold on the young hero's path to individuation. Originating in the ideas of Carl Jung, individuation is described as the process in which the individual develops a unique identity out of the blank sea of the undefined, unconscious mind. This plays out as a developmental process, during which innate elements of personality, elements of an immature psychology, like for example the shadow, and experiences and influences picked up over the person's life become, if the process succeeds, integrated over time into a well-functioning whole. Okay, so what the f*** does that mean? Well, basically, Jung's arguing that you become an individual with a unique self by crafting a narrative that puts your identity into a complete context, which you do by slowly parsing your way through a messy stew of core parts of your identity, parts of your personality that you avoid or repress, and influences from the outside world, like traumatic experiences or important role models. This dovetails nicely with Homestuck's classes, which Homestuck seems to adapt from another of Jung's ideas, the archetypes. Check out this video for more on that. But basically, the way individuation breaks down in Homestuck is, the core part of a player's identity corresponds to their spurb named class. So does their shadow, for that matter. Each class seems to have a recurring shadow struggle they succumb to at their worst, which I'll be mentioning as we go through the series. The outside influences on the players are usually their ancestors. There's some important nuances to establish here, so let me take the opportunity to outline exactly how I think roleplay works, through what I think is one of the clearest examples, Mindfang, and the way she affects the two circuit girls, Arania and Vriska. Mindfang is a legendary pirate, whose journals Vriska found growing up and drew strength from in a time of need. When we meet her alternate universe self, Arania, we learn that Mindfang's true class is that of a sylph, someone whose role includes healing, creation, and buffing other players. Kanaya makes Eridan a wand and he gets way more powerful, Arania makes Jake better and stronger, fills him with light and makes him the brightest thing in the sky, and Mindfang's story empowers Riska the same way, making her the strongest troll for much of the story. Vriska makes it very clear that she wants to be Mindfang, and goes to great lengths to live out this fantasy, and roleplay is simply a way that the abstract desire she expresses manifests in her character mechanically. Because that's the entire thrust of Vriska's early relationship with Tavros. She wants to be able to empower him, the way sylphs are naturally able to do. She even dresses up and pretends to be a literal fairy for her biggest attempt, saying she wants to make Tavros have happy thoughts and help him learn to fly. 
but she fails every time she tries. So she gets frustrated with herself for failing to make him stronger, and when this frustration gets to be too much to handle, she lashes out, often weakening him instead. No matter how much she wants to be empowering and supportive, she ends up stealing all of his agency and self-worth. Arania ends up having the opposite problem. For much of the story, she's actually pretty effective and helpful in her role as a sylph, but eventually she gets frustrated with feeling unappreciated and with always playing a passive, supportive role. Learning about her life as Mindfang inspires her, and she also tries to live out her fantasies of being cool and assertive, trying to escape her old identity, which she viewed as nerdy and unimportant. At this point, she tries to steal control of the story away from everyone else, to make herself relevant. But even at this point, she's at her most effective through empowering someone else, and she fails dramatically when it turns out she can't control the power she unleashed and can't overpower everyone else in the story by herself. The interesting thing is, both of the girls copy Mindfang in the way that distances them the most from their own core selves. Vriska tries to copy Mindfang's behavior as a sylph, playing up the fairy angle. And Arania tries to copy Mindfang's behavior as a thief, playing up the pirate angle. Both girls try to imitate Mindfang as a way to avoid or ignore the parts of themselves they dislike or are afraid of. The takeaway here is that role-playing in and of itself isn't inherently bad. Mindfang, for example, is a successful example of roleplay. At core, she's a sylph, but through years of experience, she's learned how to play the role of a thief, and integrated that role into her identity. Vriska suggests as much when she says that the difference between Mindfang and Arania is that Mindfang is an adult, and had simply acquired a lot more experience than her teenage counterpart. We also see this elsewhere. By the end of the story, most of the major characters have made some headway in combining their roles with that of their ancestors. Like, for example, Dave successfully incorporating the role of a prince into his identity at the end of Collide. Or, vice versa, Dirk finally unambiguously succeeding in playing out the role of a knight. This tells us that the more interested the descendant is in the ancestral figure, the more intense the roleplay becomes. Arania doesn't initially seem to be roleplaying, but begins stealing more and taking more of the thief's persona and aesthetic as she gets more interested in copying Mindfang. This also tells us that if a kid misunderstands their ancestor, themselves, or the relationship between them, it also affects the way they roleplay. For example, we have Rosa's attempts to copy a witch, which seem to be efforts to imitate her mom. It's only after Rose reevaluates her relationship with her mother after she dies that she starts moving away from trying to copy the image of a witch and begins experimenting with traits more traditionally associated with her mom's true class of the rogue. But even kids who aren't too interested in their ancestors will at times echo them because they're connected by way of karma. This kind of roleplay is more common to low-blood trolls, and it's also the type we tend to see from John and Jade, who are more disattached from their ancestors. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same, if less intense. Exploring the ramifications of this relationship between ancestor, descendant, and the outside world that shapes and limits both of them is crucial to understanding every single character arc in Homestuck. So I hope you enjoyed taking the time to explore the dynamic between them with me here. As always, thanks for watching. Huge thanks go out to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to help support the channel and come join us at our awesome and growing Discord community, feel free to join us for as little as a dollar a month. You can also find me on the R Hive Swap Reddit and Discord. That's all for now, so thank you again, and as always, keep rising.